I'm going to talk about the TPP, which we hope is dead. We just know that it's not being brought up for the lame duck session. That doesn't mean it won't ever happen. But I'm also going to talk a lot about the transatlantic trade um, and investment partnership, which is a, a very similar uh, trade um, deal that has been under negotiation for a couple of years now, and it's very much on the TPP model. Uh, and I, I think particularly for food and farming, um, it has really significant implications, some of which go beyond what the TPP would have done uh, and would do if, if it goes into effect. Let me see if I can get this. Uh -huh. So some of what I'm talking about, I, I actually was term limited from the legislature um, a couple of years ago. And since then, I've actually been spending a lot of my time, my professional time, um, doing work around these trade agreements, particularly around issues of the environment and agriculture. And so some of my talk is going to be drawn from this report that I worked on for the Institute for Agriculture and trade policy. And IETP actually considers itself a social justice organization as well as an organization focused on sustainable uh, farming and agricultural practices. And it's, they, they're, um, they've spent many years, actually 30 years, looking at trade agreements and trying to see how, t how they impact um, those principles of agriculture and our society. And, basically attempting to influence uh, those trade agreements in ways that are more positive um, in, in both spheres. So it's been kind of a comfortable home for me um, to be doing this work. This is a 60-page report <laughs> that um, we have the executive summary of that just focused particularly on the meat industry, but it, it has bearing uh, across the agricultural um, world. So I just... Um, Showing you that. So, as we've been discussing, the status of the TPP or the Trans Pacific Partnership isn't totally known, but it looks like, at least for now, it's going down the tubes. Um, and that is because of huge work by people here in Maine and all across the country um, pushing on this, lobbying their members of Congress, um, trying to educate people in forums like this. Uh, and that has coincided, of course, with a presidential election, which became in, in large part about these issues of trade and globalization. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, within the last several years, there actually has been no, um, it hasn't at all been clear that this could get through the House of Representatives. So, it, you know, and, and even as, as recently as the last few days, uh, there's been pressure on members of Congress to make sure that they stick by uh, their promises before to vote against it. Um, but we do have also the U.S.-EU trade uh, agreement uh, called TTIP for short. Um, that is something that has been negotiated now for a couple of years. A lot of progress has been made. A lot of progress is still to be done from the point of view of the negotiators. There's a lot of disagreements between the United States and the European Union about many of those provisions. Nonetheless, I think there's a strong possibility that this agreement, despite all of the rhetoric around trade during the presidential elections, could uh, continue on. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the things, you know, e even among our allies, when there's been discussion about trade agreements. It's generally focused on loss of jobs in the manufacturing sector. And yet these agreements have, you know, are 20 to 30 chapters, most of which have very little to do with uh, jobs in the manufacturing sector, but have much more to do with the rules of um, our society, um, whether they're environmental policies, whether they're policies around um, digital um, access and freedom of the uh, internet, um, whether it's policies around farming or, or anything else. And they, they really delve very deeply into um, the democratic process, in my view, uh, really um, uh, getting in the way of the democratic process, and intentionally so. Uh, and um, there are significant concerns. And one of the things about the TTIP, because it's with the European Union, which is a group of countries that generally do not have wages that are lower than those in the United States, I think there's going to be less uh, 
immediate concern about um, this trade agreement going forward uh, as you know not taking jobs for example because that's what most of the discussion has been about and I think it's very important that's what this talk is about is talk about kind of the rest of what's in these trade agreements and why even an agreement with the European Union based on the kinds of um, the template that they're using right now raises many many um, concerns um, so I did want to mention because Martha said and of course you're going to mention TISA I wasn't going to, but I, I, I've now stuck it on my slide, so you know, you know, meanwhile, there's been negotiations going on for several years about one of these trade agreements involving a whole bunch of countries, I think it's over 20 countries, um, that involves services. And when you say services, what does that mean? It could be everything from providing um, water uh, and whether or not water access is privatized to, um, quote, environmental services, which include garbage incinerators and solid waste pickup and recycling efforts, to financial services, to, you know, anything. Uh, and whether or not some of those, um, and, and that is a jobs issue, uh, it, it's sort of the other half of the manufacturing job concerns that we saw in the TPP. And that, there, it's being negotiated in Geneva right now. Nobody's talking about it. I like nobody. <laughs> and so, you know, again, this is one of those agreements that could happen because people are not focused on it and it raises many of the same concerns. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but then I want to also mention that, you know, uh, Fast Track was uh, approved and put into effect. And um, that is, can be extended through the year 2021, which means that any trade agreement that the next administration comes up with during the next number of years. Uh, if they do finalize an agreement and send it to Congress, it will be under these rules which limit debate uh, and which um, have a very speeded up time frame for approval. So it's really important to remember that, yes, maybe TPP isn't going anywhere right now, but there's these other agreements waiting in the wings. Uh, and they can be very easily put into effect if you have a Congress, which we will, which is of the same party as the president uh, coming in. And if, in fact, they decide these are good trade agreements, we want to approve them, they're through. So we have to remain um, vigilant about these. So um, I just put up a quote. This is on the European Agreement, or TTIP. Um, this is a quote from a couple days ago. Celia Malmstrom is the European commissioner um, who is negotiating, the top negotiator. She's like our U.S. trade representative for the European Union. And she says, well, it's going to go into the freezer. You know, what happens then? We'll have to wait and see. But then I've underlined where she says technical work will, of course, continue to go on. Well, what is the technical work? The technical work is pretty much the negotiation of this agreement. Uh, you know, one of the great disappointments for my, myself personally is that when we move from a Bush administration to an Obama administration, pretty much all the same people were in the U.S. Trade Representative's office uh, after the Bush administration into the Obama administration, and they continued to negotiate these agreements just as they had been doing in the prior administration, by and large. And that's quite likely to happen here. All this talk of draining the swamp and all that, um, I frankly think that's a lot of hooey. <laughs> and so this is happening already, and they're gonna do their best to put, get as much locked down as possible before the next administration. And we need to remember that that new administration has not um, actually mentioned the transatlantic agreement at all. Um, he's talked about um, having negotiations with other countries. Well, the European Union is a bloc that does its trade as a, a group of countries, and so it's actually considered a bilateral uh, not a multi-country agreement, but it's considered as if it was a two-country agreement. And I just put up, I mean, I went and looked at uh, Donald Trump's 100-day uh, proposal for what he's going to do when he gets in there, and it's like all about deregulation. And um, I think it's important to understand that a, a good part of these trade agreements is that's what they're about. They are about deregulation. 
And in fact, some of his proposals come straight from the European Union uh, and Britain. Uh, one of his proposals is to, if you add a regulation, you have to get rid of two, which is a completely nonsensical way of doing anything. It's as if there was some you know, parallel there. Well, that's something that was put in place in England uh, by the um, conservative premier there, and then it was copied into a European Union thing called better regulation, which is really deregulation, and it's about getting rid of laws and regulations that impede business or are burdensome. Um, and I noted here, I went and looked at um, Mr. Trump's advisory committee on agriculture, and when you get past all the state you know, uh, elected officials, of which there are many, who also come from this world. Uh, basically what you have are CEOs of some very large um, agricultural uh, agribusinesses, as well as the pharmaceutical uh, industry, pesticide manufacturers. And these are the same people that are lobbying uh, for TTIP and the TPP. And this is a graphic from the Washington Post, which shows, um, Cynthia mentioned that uh, I, I was added to this government committee. It's a state and local government committee, and I now represent the, the uh, main trade commission on that, Citizen Trade Commission. Um, those are these little yellow dots over here. So there's a couple of government people, but by and large, the industry and the industry trade group are the purple and the bluey purple colors there. And you can see who really has a seat at the table right now. So, you know, the big question is, you know, Cynthia started this um, talk by saying, you know, this is a moment when we can rethink how we do trade and, and we can come up with uh, new ways of doing things. And I think the question really has to be, you know, um, what kind of model is it and how, how do we come up with that trade agreement? Right now, it's negotiated in secret. Um, the U.S. has refused to release any of its uh, negotiating text, unlike the European Union, which actually does post some of its uh, proposals online. And that's how I can tell you a little <laughs> bit about what uh, we expect to see here. Um, but the U.S. has not, and has had this very secretive uh, model for quite a few years. Um, and it is heavily influenced by industry. There is very little participation by others. Uh, I'm on this group, but quite honestly, I don't think I have much um, influence. It's really the industry that has the seat at the table. Um, and to me, it feels a bit like window dressing for the rest of us. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if we keep the system, we're going to probably come out with a new trade um, approach that's the same as the old one. And so I, I just think that that is something we need to be thinking about at this time. Um, and, and the other is, you know, we, we have really a broken food system, and if we are going to be coming up with a new model for trade, the question has to be, is it going to produce just the same results as the old model in terms of our food and agricultural um, system, or is it going to take a different approach and come up with different results? And this is just a graphic from IATP about, in fact, you know, it's about all this globalization and exporting all our stuff and reducing tariffs and uh, all the other things that are in NAFTA and that are part of the farm bill. We're looking at falling farm incomes. People are getting fatter because we're eating really bad food a lot of the time. Um, there's really significant environmental impacts. Uh, and so, you know, again, if we want to get something different, then we have to have a different system and, and trade rules and globalization are part of that. And so it's going to be a real challenge to figure out um, how we get something different. And this is just a little slide. I live up in Hollowell. This is from my local Kennebec Journal. But, you know, Maine has actually done a lot to try to promote um, sustainable local farms, whether it's from our forever farms, you know, where we have um, easements, whether it's, you know, promoting um, local, you know, um, slaughterhouses here. This is, you know, so this doesn't have to be shipped out of state and basically, you know, be something that is only accessible to the largest um, agribusinesses. These are things that we're working very hard um, to achieve. We have a lot going in terms of getting local fo food into farmers markets, you know, local procurement. 
and all of those sorts of things. And so, again, the question is, both globally and locally, you know, are we going to have a trade system that supports this or that supports something different? Um, and this is just a graphic, which I don't think you can really see very well, except that, you know, one, this, this is Tyson Foods here, Smithfield Foods here. Um, I can't really see the writing, but these are different, basically, global com companies that, um, you know, you have Tyson Foods. Smithfield Foods is now owned by a Chinese conglomerate. Um, there's only a couple of very large um, companies that now control um, much of the global meat market, as well as other, um, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, products. And they're global. I mean, when we say Smithfield Food, that big Iowa company or whatever, but it's not. It's now Chinese. Um, and there's a, a big company that's based in Brazil that's now moving to um, Ireland. You know, so they're global. They, and this comes into play um, as we look into other aspects of, of these trade agreements. And, you know, while we have been moving towards this um, very consolidated and global process, what it has actually meant for um, rural communities and for farms is some real devastation. Right now, four companies control 82% of beef slaughter, two-thirds of pork slaughter, and um, two companies control half of poultry slaughter. Um, so essentially, and these have been aided by um, trade rules, but also by the lack of enforcement around antitrust uh, laws and policies in this country. Um, and this is not just in the United States. I mean, uh, but you know, this has um, really happened since NAFTA. NAFTA kind of started this ball rolling, and, and these uh, newer trade agreements are based on that NAFTA model. Since NAFTA went into effect, 90% uh, of all of the um, pig farmers um, in the US, the independent pig farmers, are out of business completely out of business. So basically everyone's working on, to, on a contract system um, for these giant companies like Smithfield or um, Tyson Foods or um, Pilgrim, I think is the one that's the, the Brazilian company. And the same thing has happened wherever they've gone. So I've done some work around the European Union and when Smithfield moved into, the, uh, into Eastern Europe, um, the number of pig farmers in Poland dropped um, by 56% percent in the space of less than a decade. Um, so, and they basically, they're very concentrated companies and they, they control all, everything from, you know, growing the animal to the slaughter, to the marketing, you know, to fuel, to, to food and all of that. So this was the global system that we're moving towards. And I, I think that, or that is in largely in place to some extent. Um, throughout the world, but especially in the United States and Canada um, and some other countries like Brazil. And so it's really a question whether to the, you know, can any of this be reversed or are we stuck with us forever? Um, and, and that's a question for us in the U.S., I think, as we try to do something different in Maine and in some other states. Um, but then the question is also, can this be stopped at all in terms of places where they still have family farms? You know, and again, my work in Europe they still have family farms in a lot of Europe, especially um, Austria and some of these other countries um, more in Eastern Europe. And so the question is whether um, this is going to be the model of the future as well um, for those countries. So one of the handouts is this little paper that I actually contributed to, written by IATP. Um, and it does look at the TPP. One, I mentioned the secrecy around um, um, the U.S. trade, uh, you know, proposals. We, we can't read anything that they're proposing or that they've agreed to until after they sign the whole thing. So they did that. They signed the whole thing with the TPP, then sent it to Congress. So now, you know, after they've done it, we can go look at the thousands of pages, you know, and try to figure out what's in there. And there's some really bad things. <laughs> and... Um, so it's really important to look at this because, as I mentioned, we, with the European agreement that's still under negotiation, we can kind of see where the um, European Union is going because they posted a lot of their proposals. 
But um, really, the only, the only way we can figure out how, where the US is going is to take a look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is now public, and see what's in it. Um, and because um, the US has, has publicly said, and I can kind of confirm based on my uh, see a little bit at the table that they, they basically start their negotiations from the point of which the TPP left off. So you can imagine that they simply have taken the Trans-Pacific Partnership, taken over to Europe and say, and now we want to do this too with you. So it's really uh, helpful, uh, especially if it doesn't go into effect, to be able to use that to analyze um, these other proposals that are out there. And with respect to food and agriculture, um, there's a number of things that um, the TPP does, some of which is really for the first time or it sort of goes beyond anything that's in earlier agreements. And one of those areas is food safety and the ability to enforce um, effective food safety um, rules and have inspections. One of those areas is to look at the science that's used and to essentially make it more difficult to regulate uh, based on these sort of scientific principles. And I'll get into a little, uh, each of these. Um, a whole area where there's a whole special little article has to do with promoting um, genetically modified foods and sort of new technologies. Uh, and um, there's also provisions uh, which the European Union is very much in favor of in their proposals of restricting labeling uh, of food and you know there's a lot of areas I talked about obesity uh, one of the areas that um, a lot of countries including the US to some extent have pushed on is to try to make have better labeling on food so that you can at least know what you're buying and make you know kind of healthy food cho choices uh, but the TPP has provisions in it that will make it harder to do that and then there's something called um, regulatory cooperation um, which is in the TPP, but especially in the transatlantic agreement, which is about sort of having this, quote, living agreement that will change into the future. And there's some really significant questions about that because it's bad enough to not be able to see what the agreement is, you know, but then it's written on paper once it gets into effect. But if this is a changing and, and growing agreement in the future, then it matters very much who's at the table and what the rules are about that regulatory cooperation. And unfortunately, um, it's very much um, the same folks who were at the table in the first place, which is the regulated industries, um, are going to be the ones writing those rules. So just to very quickly go through a little bit about um, what is going on right now and how um, it could be affected um, by these agreements. Um, one of the things the U.S. does that actually is, um, you know, really pretty horrible, is our way of um, uh, ensuring that food is healthy and safe. And in the European Union, they have this policy called um, farm to fork, which basically looks at trying to keep uh, food um, uncontaminated and healthy, right from you know the very moment is planted or with a animal it's grown through the you know processing and into the supermarket and the u.s doesn't have that approach because it's a lot more expensive than simply not worrying about it too much and then you go to the end and you spray everything with chemicals that supposedly kills everything uh, that's bad and then it goes into the supermarket and this is an approach that the u.s really wants to export to other countries and it's something that uh, if you're putting into a trade agreement that this is the appropriate approach, it makes it very difficult to change your laws and regulations in your own country uh, to make them better. And so um, this is a huge issue with the European Union, and it should be an issue here. If people only knew that their chicken was pretty much basically dipped into chlorine uh, before it goes to the grocery store, they wouldn't be so enthusiastic about eating it. Uh, and, of course, we have a lot of problems with contaminated chicken. And right now, our inspection system is really, really inadequate already. Uh, only 1% um, of imported fish and seafood are inspected in the United States, and only 3% of all food uh, shipments are inspected. And mostly, they're just looked at for sort of obvious danger, you know, defects and things that pop right out. 
Um, so this is something that is already broken in the United States. It's poorly funded. And unfortunately, in the TPP and what the US wants to get into the transatlantic uh, agreement is something that will make it more difficult to have more inspections. Um, the goal is to limit inspections to, quote, what is reasonable and necessary, um, which are legal terms that, um, well, it, how do you prove that something is necessary, let's just say? And when you've already kind of dumbed down the system to a low level, it makes it much harder to build it up. And so these are all words that have been uh, litigated in the World Trade Organization context and others, uh, and they've been challenged um, as um, unfair burdens on, on trade and unfair burdens on the market um, by imposing these kinds of inspections. So this is a concern because um, we really need to actually make, uh, have more inspections, not less. Uh, but the TPP has provisions in it that will actually make that harder to do. I wanted to point out that one of the um, concerns that we have in the US about the way we do things uh, actually relates to not only the consumer eating chicken that isn't really that great, but also the people who work in these factories work under horrendous conditions. And Oxfam America has done some incredible reporting on this. And honestly, I mean, I have just stopped eating um, chicken that is not local. And, you know, I mean, th these are people who are not given bathroom breaks. The, you know, these are, there's, you, you want to talk about, um, you know, kind of vulnerable labor forces, whether it's migrants or um, even sometimes prison labor. Uh, but there are people that don't have people representing them a lot of the time, especially in the chicken um, factories. And um, they're treated very badly. And one of the interesting things that we found out in this paper that uh, I, I co-wrote about the meat industry is that this is an area actually in the European Union where the sort of the same thing happens. It's kind of fascinating because it is an area where there's a lot of industrialization, these kind of meat packing um, plants. And the same thing is going on there because even though overall they have higher minimum wages and all these other things in the European Union, it turns out that in these meat packing factories, uh, there's like exceptions. And so there's a lot of migrant workers that don't get the same minimum wage, that don't get the same protections, and that face some of some similar situations that we have in the United States. So I wanted to mention this because I don't think it always um, gets the attention um, it deserves. And, you know, there's significant environmental impacts from these kinds of operations. Um, this is a, a statistic about um, CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations that, um, in fact, 45, 454 million tons, 500 million U.S. tons of manure each year is, um, you know, produced, uh, which is more than that of the entire U.S. population. And one of the things, you know, I sort of knew this already, but when I wrote this report, I've, the, the, the agriculture business is so um, powerful in this country that they actually have prevented Congress from even, um, well, or Congress has prevented the, the Environmental Protection Agency from even requiring that these um, concentrated feeding lots be you know, publicly listed, like where they are, who the owners are, and all that sort of basic information. And that's not even getting to what kind of regulations you have. So they're basically been, they've been exempted out of the, um, requirements around climate uh, reporting of um, emissions. And there's just sort of a whole separate way that they're treated. And because the, the, these companies are so powerful, and again, these are the same companies that are behind these trade agreements. And again, we'll get into some of those specific provisions that are of concern. Um, as I mentioned, the TPP has a special um, annex in it that promotes um, GMO and biotech agriculture. And this is a graph that just shows what's going on in terms of adoption of um, uh, genetically modified uh, crops. You know, there's a lot of debate about the health of that, but I thought it was pretty interesting that the New York Times came out just a couple weeks ago with this article about how genetically modified crops have not led to less use of pesticide as they were supposedly going to do. They've actually, pesticide use has increased. 
which is not surprising because you have the same companies that are producing the seed as well as the pesticides. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> there, there's no financial interest in reducing pesticide use you know, here. Uh, and so what we see is, and, and just you know, uh, some statistics, is that 60% of our processed foods in US supermarkets have gen genetically modified soy, canola, or corn in it. Um, which is huge. And you know, there's some crops where it's almost all of the crops are genetically modified, like the soybeans there, it's that top line. Um, so that's what's going on. And so these agreements are about making sure that the US can export its model of, of agriculture, basically, and its products. And there are other countries, including the European Union, that don't want these um, modified organisms. They don't want this kind of um, product. And the goal of these trade agreements is to ensure that they take them. And they do that by uh, including in a number of provisions, including one of them that's in the TPP that just says basically, um, you know, encourages support of uh, licensing of GMO, but also there's a, a wide range of provisions under the regulatory cooperation provisions that are aimed at what's called mutual recognition and essentially saying, okay, EU, you don't need to change your policies. Um, you just need to accept that you know, our uh, system is just as safe as yours. And in this agreement, you're accepting it's just as safe. As a result, we can sell anything that we produce here to you and vice versa. Uh, and it's a way of basically, you know, the European Union can say we haven't changed our standards, but in fact they have because they are importing products from the United States based on this trade agreement. You know, these USDA reports, are, that's from a USDA report, they're actually quite interesting. Um, they did a report on um, like meat, the meat industry, and they basically said getting rid of tariffs won't um, help U.S. producers sell their meat in Europe. The only way we'll help them is we have to get rid of all the rules and regulations in Europe that prevent them from buying our products, like bans on hormones, you know, um, bans on GMO. <laughs> and so these are trade barriers. They're not, in the view of the people writing these agreements, they're not uh, healthy food rules, they're not environmental rules, they're trade barriers, and a trade agreement is about getting rid of those barriers. Uh, so that's what the TTIP is all about. Um, so again, um, one of the, the things that's in the TPP, and again, you know, I'm mentioning the European Union, but it's important to understand that these are trade rules that apply to both the U.S. and to whatever country that we're, um, you know, agreeing with on the trade agreement. So it may initially affect that other country if they already have um, rules that say, you know, we don't allow GMO, let's say, or we don't allow hormone in beef. Um, but it also affects us here in the U.S. because even though we allow these things, it makes it almost impossible for us to ever change our rules to be more like what the European Union has right now. And so it, it's, and it's kind of like a super law that's over and above, um, you know, our domestic laws. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. Um, and so the question is, you know, is this really promoting um, good food? And the answer is it's not. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the EU has, and many other countries, have some pretty strict, um, and they could be better, but there's still fairly strict rules around um, routine use of hormones and growth promoters and all of that. In the U.S., we do not. Um, and pigs, um, this is a statistic, two-thirds of all cattle were administered some form of hormones with 90% of all feedlots, 100% of large-scale commercial feedlots using growth promoters. And that's, of course, most of what you buy in the supermarket. Unless you buy local and organic, this is what you're going to be getting. Um, and in the case of um, pork, um, and, and here's why. You know, if you have these giant um, agricultural operations where you cram these animals in, um, <laughs> they're going to get sick. And so, you know, they're just routinely fed um, drugs. And this is why the pharmaceutical industry is very much, I mean, 
it's about people drugs, but it's a lot about animal drugs. Uh, they're very supportive of these trade agreements. Um, you know, so, you, you know, this is the model, and it produces, like, cheaper food um, that costs less to the consumer. Um, but the problem is there's all these side effects, and the side effects are also those environmental side effects that we went through and the worker side effects that we went through. Um, and, you know, the increased pesticide side effects. And these are not, you know, in the price of your pork chop. You know, when you buy that pork chop, you're not paying for those side effects. In fact, that's being either not dealt with at all, as in the case of those giant um, feeding lots and manure pits. Uh, when we had the big uh, the hurricane that hit uh, North Carolina, one of the side effects there was that all these animal, these pits with you know manure in them, like sprung a leak and went all over the place, causing huge environmental damage beyond what it already was. Uh, and so this is a model that really our farm bill is built around, and these trade agreements, unsurprisingly, are very much about promoting that, that those products, you know, to be sold around the world. And the result is it's really promoting that whole model of agriculture. And again, if we go back to that earlier slide, these are multinational companies that are promoting this. So in a way, you know, they're they're sort of outside of the U.S. They're really looking at how to make their profits and sell their goods as any place they can. Um, so one of the concerns about these trade agreements is that they are between two countries um, at their federal level, but they have implications um, for uh, policies that aren't adopted at the federal level but adopted at the state and local level. And so we'll talk a little later about corporate um, lawsuits against those policies, but even just w without those lawsuits, the, um, these trade agreements have provisions in them that either prohibit or make it very difficult to have policies at the state and local level that are different from what the federal government has. Um, if they go beyond uh, what the federal government does. Now, under our constitutional system of federalism, the states have long had the authority um, to adopt their own policies unless explicitly preempted by federal law. Um, and so these trade agreements actually reach into um, the relationship between the state and federal government in a way that um, is inconsistent with what's in our own um, federal constitution. Uh, and also uh, are likely to make it more uh, or less likely that we're going to change any of these bad policies in the future. Because change is happening not in Congress, <laughs> unsurprisingly, but it happens because we have states out there taking a stand and trying to push uh, those policies differently. And so, you know, we recently had Congress finally taking action on G GMO labeling and toxic chemical reform. Neither of those laws are particularly great. Um, the GMO labeling law is a weak one, and the TOSCA reform, the Toxic Chemical uh, Control Act, um, could be much better. But the only reason Congress moved to try to do anything on a national level is because states had stepped up and enacted much more uh, aggressive policies, more protective policies, uh, and finally, the industry went to Congress and said, we don't like this, all these different policies all over the country. You know, you need to step in and do something. And so, at least for those states that had nothing, actually what's, what was adopted by Congress is better uh, than nothing. And, you know, the states that have played this role um, will continue to do that. Well, again, these trade agreements are, are intended to harmonize rules and regulations between the two countries. And you can't harmonize, let's say, you know, federal policy around antibiotics with a different policy in another country if you have 50 states doing something different. And so there's some very specific provisions in these trade agreements that's in the TPP that's proposed for the TTIP um, that would make it very difficult. And this is just a quote. Um, there's lots of quotes I could have put up. <laughs> that, <laughs> The U.S. Trade Representative had a hearing when the, trans, uh, the TTIP negotiations started. Two-day hearing. I went down and testified on behalf of the um, uh, Maine Trade Commission. Um, 
it was fascinating because these companies were very clear about what the purpose of this trade agreement was in their view. And several of them, like the soybean people, because they were, they, you know, they're about GMOs and they don't want labeling. Um, and this group, the United States Council for International Business, said specifically that you should not have uh, EU member states or US states uh, allowed to seek to impose separate requirements for approval or local restrictions on sale or use of anything. And of course, there's a lot of things that right now we do have restrictions on. Here's one example here where California has uh, different rules around antibiotics. Maine has different rules around toxic chemicals in, in products, including food um, packaging, like BPA-free packaging that um, we have. Um, there's animal welfare rules that are different. Uh, and, and so this is what um, these, these companies, companies want this agreement to do. And in fact, you know, there's various provisions in it right now that in fact do that. Um, so this is an example, animal welfare. I don't know if you saw one of the only good news from my point of view <laughs> of what happened on election day was that Massachusetts passed a comprehensive uh, animal welfare uh, provisions by referenda uh, about animal crowding in um, cages and things like that. And so uh, they joined California in having a really comprehensive law. One of the things I looked at uh, in this report I did was what the animal welfare laws are in this country. And honestly, it's like it, it goes back, we're looking, it's a couple centuries ago basically is the model that was set. And uh, states have animal cruelty laws. Most of them exempt out anything on a farm from any kind of standard whatsoever. Well, one of the things that these trade agreements do, I mentioned sort of uh, the science behind the standards. Um, animal welfare, it depends, you know, you, you have to sort of prove in these trade agreements that a regulation is necessary and supported by science. Well, what does that really mean? Um, you know, if it's something where you care about how animals feel, that is not a scientific principle. That is a, a, a subjective, <laughs> it's a subjective thing. I mean, an objective thing might be they get sick, that's not good for our health, that they get sick when they're crowded. But a subjective thing is, I don't want animals to be, you know, ripping the heads off each other, you know, in these cages. Um, these trade rules do not support that kind of um, decision making. Um, they just don't. Um, that's just not science. Uh, and so really it's designed to, to reduce um, those kinds of animal welfare um, provisions. One of the areas I talked about um, uh, labeling standards and making it more difficult to label. Um, this is one of the areas where the rules are particularly difficult. You, you know, the languages you have to show that it is necessary. And again, there's a strong focus on harmonizing the federal regulations. Um, this is, these are two um, examples of um, European Union and US uh, labels. Um, if, again, you know, if the US does not have labeling of this sort and a state wants to do it, uh, under these trade agreements, it's intended to make it very difficult or impossible for the state to adopt um, stronger standards than what the federal uh, government has. So, and overall, the goal of these um, agreements, and it's in both the TPP and what the US is proposing under TTIP, is essentially once something's been approved in one country, you can sell it in the other country um, without any further restrictions. So what does that really mean? Um, you know, this was a big concern with the TPP with seafood where you had, um, you know, really um, horrible stuff actually coming from Vietnam and some of these other countries not being inspected um, and being allowed in potentially. But the same thing is in the TTIP. It would apply to any kinds of policies. So, you know, for example, I talked about the BPA um, packaging rules. Um, you know, if the U.S. doesn't have those restrictions and something comes over from the European Union, it meets the U.S. standard, but it doesn't meet Maine standard under this once approved sold everywhere standard, Maine couldn't prevent it from coming in. 
So, you know, California has rules about labeling uh, products saying that they cause cancer, if they've been found to can cause cancer. Uh, California's decision on Roundup, or glyphosate, uh, is different than that of the European Union and of the U.S. So if the European Union approves something coming over to the United States, it meets the U.S. standard, it doesn't meet the California standard, it runs afoul of this, once approved, sold everywhere. So again, this is how these trade agreements, they're being negotiated at the federal level, but they affect what happens at the state and local level um, as well. One of the areas and one of the ways that Maine and other states have really um, succeeded in supporting uh, local sustainable agriculture is the farm to school program, but also expanding that to go into hospitals, into colleges, into uh, multiple institutions. One of the things that's in the transatlantic or EU trade agreement, the European Union wants to actually make it much more difficult to do that and apply it to um, all kinds of institutions, including universities, corrections facilities, uh, state and local government. Um, we have protections under the federal farm law um, that protect the school lunch program, but that law does not protect any of these other programs. And so the idea being that you would have to open it up to uh, purchase from anywhere or anyone, uh, including the European Union. Otherwise, your local uh, purchasing would be considered a burden on trade and would violate these trade agreements. So one of the things that um, this trade agreement, um, the EU agreement has, and the TPP had to a little extent, was this thing called regulatory cooperation. And the way I look at it is kind of like this one-two punch. You know, the regulatory cooperation is about trying to make sure that the rules and regulations are um, as weak as possible, basically. Um, and so, and I'll talk about how you get to that. Um, but let's say you actually manage to get through this regulatory cooperation and you put in place uh, you know, a, a new law, let's say, that regulates uh, concentrated animal feeding operations or, you know, and prevents those big manure pits and gets rid of, you know, puts in place some animal welfare restrictions we don't have right now and, you know, uh, addresses those workplace conditions. So you get that through, but then you have this, the second punch, which is the uh, investor state dispute system. Uh, where these laws and regulations can be challenged by corporations and special um, tribunals. So regulatory cooperation is this idea that these trade agreements are, quote, living agreements that um, will continue to go on because there's, of course, new laws and regulations that we try to pass in the future. And so these trade agreements try to say, well, how do we deal with those? Well, we'll get together and sit around the table, regulated industry and the trade uh, negotiators, and you know we will um, encourage them to essentially uh, get rid of burdensome and um, duplicative and um, trade uh, burdening rules and regulations. And they would put in place all kinds of cost-benefit analysis that isn't required right now and studies. Uh, and the overall premise is that you couldn't put into place new regulations unless they were, quote, least trade restrictive. And you have to look at doing nothing or, you know, some voluntary policy. And, of course, we have a lot of those in the U.S., like our Consumer Product Safety Commission. They have to try a voluntary policy before they go to a mandatory policy. That is our current law right now. And the goal here is take that model and, and put it into place and really make it almost impossible to not have that model because it's going to be in a trade agreement. Uh, and so this is a way of really inserting uh, into the very earliest stages of regulation, uh, industry influence, industries that are supposed to be regulated by these rules and regulations. Um, as well as essentially um, 
you know, potentially delaying forever <laughs> many of those rules and regulations as they constantly go through more and more study, um, trying to determine, um, you know, whether there's, you know, whether they're worth doing. And of course, all of these studies, you know, are what industry is coming forward saying, you know, these policies interfere with our ability to do business, they cut into our profits, um, come up with something that costs us less. Uh, so this is what regulatory cooperation um, is about, and the European Union has actually proposed maybe 20 pages of very detailed stuff about what has to happen and, you know, getting notified in advance of any proposals for regulation, uh, going through all of this analysis, even at the state and local level. So that's regulatory cooperation. I think um, many you have probably heard about ISDS or the Investor State Dispute Settlement System. Um, you know, when the Obama administration finally decided Keystone XL was a bad idea, almost immediately the company sued under this uh, trade provision that's on, in NAFTA saying, you're taking our profits, A, and B, you're doing it in a way that is, doesn't really provide us due process. Previous pipelines got permits. We came forward with a similar proposal and you didn't give us the permit, therefore that is unfair. Under the trade law, we want a remedy, and that remedy is humongous damages. And they've actually asked for billions of dollars in damages uh, in this. Um, one of the things about the Transatlantic uh, Agreement is that it dramatically increases the number of companies that could sue to use this um, uh, mechanism. You know, under NAFTA, most of the companies are actually in the US. Um, and NAFTA is just between Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. And to use this mechanism, a company has to have a subsidiary or it has to be based in another country and then sue you. Uh, under the TTIP, you see here that we have a huge number of additional companies, um, 50, almost 51,000 U.S. subsidiaries um, are based abroad and uh, would be empowered to use this um, process. It's not a court system. It involves arbitration. There's a lot of secrecy involved with it. The rules that are applied are not necessarily the constitutional law rules, but they're rules that make it are easier for, for corporations to prove. And an example, um, I think, okay, let me just go back. An example of, in a, a food example here is, I don't know how many of you have follow, follow Monsanto news, uh, but my, uh, the, the very large, um, Corporation Bayer Chemicals, which is, uh, makes Bayer aspirin, you know, that's the, the positive side of Bayer Chemical, <laughs> but it's a huge chemical uh, conglomerate that makes pesticides and other kinds of chemicals. They are seeking to buy Monsanto. It has to still go through antitrust review, but if in fact they succeed in that, then Monsanto or Bayer now will be perfectly positioned to sue everybody in the United States about any kind of policy uh, that they enact um, that Monsanto doesn't like. And Monsanto didn't like the GMO labeling. Monsanto doesn't like, uh, you know, regulations around um, protecting bees from pesticides. Uh, Monsanto is opposed to all kinds of uh, rules and regulations about how pesticides are applied. Um, these are all things that um, the animal welfare, you name it, um, these are huge companies and they're now potentially going to be based in the European Union and if this trade agreement goes in then they will be able to use this uh, mechanism as opposed to going through the courts like anybody else. And of course this is not a two-way street, this is a mechanism that can only be used by corporations but um, those of us individuals, states, the U.S. can't sue Monsanto uh, through this mechanism. It's a one-way street um, and Many of these companies have been very successful in getting um, millions and billions of dollars in damages uh, under these um, cases. So just to sum up, um, there's a lot of provisions in the TTIP as well as in the TPP if it goes into effect um, that could really um, make it more difficult for us to ever change the way we do farming and food policy in the United States. Um, and certainly would export a U.S. model that is really based on agribusiness. Um, one of those that I mentioned is procurement, which has to do with, you know, um, buy local. 
Um, the labeling standards, whether it was labeling for GMO or for chemicals um, or consumer labeling uh, at the grocery store um, are all potentially um, at risk. Um, the regulatory cooperation provisions um, really, the way I like to think of it is there's this really secretive model of negotiating trade agreements right now that involves mostly corporations and, you know, kind of backroom negotiations. And regulatory cooperation essentially moves that into the future after the trade agreement is si signed and, um, you know, in effect and would affect all future laws and regulations. So it, it's sort of, you know, exporting this really undemocratic model of decision making um, into the future and, and really sort of taking over our, our system of government in a way. Um, in addition, it will exponentially expand the use of ISDS, the investor um, lawsuits. And basically taken together, these policies promote industrialized um, agribusiness and will make it much more difficult for us to, to really change that model and have a sustainable, climate-friendly future, um, which is, I think, what everyone in this room um, certainly wants to have. So that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>